Hello. <laughs> Aloha. Hola. <laughs> Hola. Okay. Aloha. <laughs> so uh, if you want to take the time to just see everybody before we start the talk, it's important if you are up to it. Little pulling out of our introverted <laughs> worlds. And you can you can lift up your cats or dogs if they happen by. They <laughs> they, they want to be seen. They want the unconditional loving kindness. <laughs> they want us to care about their hurt and hunger, and they want us to celebrate their happiness and playfulness. And they like us when we're calm. We're not bothering them. Good teachers. Ah, there's oh, yeah, there you are. In Australia. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Happy face. Dave and Kaylin, Margo. The kitty. Kitty. Yay, kitty. Show and tell. Kitty, kitty. Oh, Alyssa there. It's Karen. Include all, all beings. We love all beings. So yes, <laughs> make sure uh, you're yeah. using your your beautiful house beings as a Brahma Vihara focuses for unconditional kindness and care, appreciation, uh, even minded. You know, okay when they're a little naughty. Okay, but you know, reasonably in stability when they're happy and want to play a lot. So, but you don't have to jump all over your jeans or dress. So you just put out an equanimous energy. Things as they are, my little kitty catty. Things wow. as they are. Nice dog, Cynthia. It's so nice, cats, dogs. So, um, Maybe I'll start the talk, the talk with a, yesterday I saw, I didn't plan this, but yesterday I saw a woman with a t-shirt on that said, I wish, I wish I was the person that my dog thinks I am. <laughs> and then I thought, um, boy, I hope I'm not, I'm not the person my cat thinks I am <laughs> because <laughs> she really has a lot of disgruntled feelings about me. <laughs> so it's really funny. To, See that I think I want to make a T-shirt that says the, the, the thing about the cat. <laughs> and the other thing is that I notice when I go for walks um, <clears throat> that a lot of people have dogs that are pulling them off into the grass and off. That the dogs just pull people off their path into like the the just wherever they're smelling. I think, but it's really fun to watch. Um, the humans are just all walking in one line and they don't kind of go off their route, but the dogs are pulling them off. And I noticed that with the feral cats, it's like they don't follow any human kind of linear pattern. And, and I think the practice is like that, like the practice of just taking the time to do a loving kindness weekend and a sitting. Um, we see that we tend to want to have that kind of control of, of knowing where we're going and where we're going to get to and that there's somewhere to go. And I think that it's very refreshing to have that um, connection with animals that we, they help us kind of get off our um, conditioned path. So, um, and speaking of that, I think early January is a time to kind of, somebody said um, in the questions, I'm not sure if it was today, but you know, that this is a time of resetting, a resetting of kind of motivation and reconnecting with values, deep values, finding deep motivations and um, our intentions. And, and we kind of, um, at the beginning of the retreat, set a certain 
intention for the loving kindness retreat of, of just that intention to come back to accessing the kindness that's already there. And I thought I'd, I'd begin with um, Henry David Thoreau. Um, his, there's a book of his wildflowers um, by the days of the year, not every day. So I'm gonna read one of my favorites for winter. Uh, it's from January 10th, 1858. The north side of Walden Pond is a warm walk in sunny weather. If you are sick and despairing, go forth in winter and see the red alder catkins dangling at the extremities of the twigs, all in the wintry air, like long hard mulberries promising a new spring in the fulfillment of all our hopes. Prize any tenderness, any softening in winter. So I think that's a beautiful way to begin January and the year to, to have that intention to prize any tenderness, to prize any softening in the heart. prize any moment of kindness. We often are judging that there aren't enough rather than maybe to prize that there's been a few moments of kindness. This morning, um, the, the, the mornings in Hawaii, maybe not compared to the North, but they've been very cool or what we would call cold. <laughs> and the, um, I noticed that it, it makes me happy to see the feral cats all find places in the sun. And um, they move, you know, over the hours of the morning, they move to where the sun is and they curl up and they look like they're just soaking it in, just soaking it in. So in a way that's kind of prizing any tenderness that, that, that when, you, when we do have moments of kindness that we, we can kind of pause and just soak them in. That's the practice of the Brahma Vihara is that you're not necessarily noticing them change. You're, notice, you're noticing that you can kind of soak it in until they change. <laughs> I have a very old friend in Honolulu um, that uh, I met in 1977 and he um, had told me that after 20 years of Vipassana practice, this, this was in the this was in the late 90s that he told me this after 20 years of Vipassana practice, he had done a meta retreat with us, and um, he said that after after doing the meta retreat, he said it was like. Um, his Vipassana practice was like standing in the sunlight without receiving its warmth for 20 years. And it, that had such a big impact for me, just like I can't, it's so um, in my heart, just like the sadness of that, that he had done 20 years of Vipassana without feeling any warmth. And, and it, of course, all these ways in which the Brahma Viharas have affected all of us and we've seen, of course, you see that we keep bringing it in more and more, um, the importance of it. And, and um, I'm sure as we were talking about this morning in the question and answer, there are ways in which we've been really attempting to bring in into the Vipassana practice itself, rather than keep the practices so separate to help us be able to feel kindness towards our thoughts or kindness towards our emotions or with, with, with our bodies, with how to, how to do that, all the different ways we're offering, how to bring the practice into the moment to moment um, insight practice. 
So the Vipassana practice is meant to go, it's meant to go in a very inclusive, inclusive direction that includes all experience that's possible in the human world and in the universe. And the metta practice is meant again to be inclusive of all beings everywhere, everywhere in the universe unconditionally. So the, the Vipassana practice is an unconditional, without conditions, acceptance of all experience that can happen. And the, the metta practice and the Brahma Viharas are that un, without conditions that we care about ourselves or others. It's not like I care about you if you do this, or if you're like that, or I love myself if I'm like this, or if I'm like that. And sometimes it's um, important, you know, Steve gave a talk the first night about the four Brahma Viharas. It's helpful to remember that the, the loving kindness practice is meant to be a foundation of the, the connecting with the mind heart to the softening of that heart, the um, foundation of open, open, soft connection of kindness. And uh, what's hard for us sometimes is that we're not tuning into behavior. We're not tuning into, in this, in this practice, we're not tuning into the behavior of ourselves or others. Um, we're tuning into our essential goodness. Again, something that we, we need to re-remember and re-remember um, as we do the four Brahma Viharas, that, that this is the foundation of, of the, just to remind you, the foundation of just being able to find our heart, to find it, to connect with our and others' hearts. So you'll hear when we begin with an easy being, you, you get the felt sense of the being, not even the image, you get the felt sense, you get the felt sense of yourself, not necessarily the image. And you get into that, like that we're worthy, this, this heart is worthy of kindness, worthy of care, the being, our beings are worthy, as all beings are worthy. Sometimes the Buddha would describe the experience of loving kindness or metta as when um, a mother cow would give birth to a baby cow and that moment of eye contact. And, and so I think, again, if we brought a newborn into the screen here, if somebody brought a newborn, most, most, most people would, their heart would go, oh, right? Like, it's like, oh, that it's just natural, right? It's natural to feel that way about the newborn. You're not thinking of that being as a teenager who's giving you a really hard time, right? That, you know, you're not thinking of the being when they're 85 and they can't remember anything. It's like, you're, you're not, you're not thinking like that. You're just tuning into that newborn energy. And what we learn in Vipassana is that each moment, it, the chitta, consciousness is taking birth. It dies, it takes birth. Every moment we have a newborn heart. So we're not tuning into age or behavior. We're tuning into that essence of newborn heart the goodness there, the vulnerability there that we all share. <laughs> Very important that we all share. This is a poem. Very short by um, Wang An Shi, who lived from 1021 to 1086. And China. And he wrote these poems when he was old, very old, the last years of his life. This is one of his last poems. It's called On the Terrace for Mind Source. He dedicated his poem for the source of the mind. <laughs> Grown old, I can't read tiny script but bamboo mats offer comforting darkness of sleep. 
taking it. Words deserted. I'm almost newborn again. I think um, maybe you have to be old to appreciate that. Almost that all I feel. I'm almost newborn again. You know, it's so beautiful. And that that the comfort of the darkness of sleep and it's so beautiful. Um, words deserted. So yes, of course he is newborn every moment as we all are, but we lose touch with it so easily. We lose touch with our goodness and others' goodness so easily. Uh, the first meta retreat I did was, uh, I think, two months. And um, the first week, it was a done as a concentration practice. And the first week was very much, I'd call it a real slog. It was really, really hard. And uh, on the seventh day, I started to have some experiences like I had a sitting right before my interview that was um, my felt a lot of loving kindness and my mind felt quite alive and bright and I went in for to my interview and um, I was kind of um, beaming it like I didn't I wasn't intending to but I wasn't kind of containing it uh, and the teacher <laughs> said to, said to me uh, what would happen to your meta right now if somebody hit you with a stick? And I just, it just popped kind of this bubble of like, like intense meta, like I was in, I was very identified with it and very like into it. And I was like, well, I said it would go like immediately <laughs> I don't like when I hit the person back, you know, and it was so great because we both started laughing and, and I just said, yeah, more, more practice, <laughs> interview over. Okay, I get the point, I get the point. Uh, but it was really uh, funny. Uh, and I, I, I have the sense now of, with the loving kindness practice of a much more quiet, quiet, experience of it where it really is more like the experience of what of holding a baby bird in in your hand you know so it just like if you get into the felt sense of that right now of like what it would feel like to hold a baby bird in your hand that's our that's all of our hearts that's that's the the connection with the newborn heart and we can see just again how how beautiful that is and how open and connecting we can feel with it, but also again how vulnerable that is and how we need the other Brahma Viharas, the caring about the pain, the appreciating the joy, and that deep unconditional evenness and acceptance of the joys and sorrows. There was a, um, a book I read many years ago called uh, The Mother, Archetypal Image and Fairy Tales by Sybil Burkhauser Ori. Edited uh, very beautifully by Marie-Louise von Franz. And she said in it, it is precisely the mistakes people make and the difficulties they experience, which forced them to develop in ways they would not otherwise have chosen. And I often have that as a kind of um, ground or anchor or lighthouse for myself. I read it a lot because I think it's so important uh, for all of us that we have, we're, we're so trained to um, value perfection this perfectionism and not to value our mistakes. And, and when we don't value our mistakes, then we can't learn from this. We can't do what she's saying here. And I find it so um, compassionate, just so 
so makes space for love and kindness. It, it is precisely the mistakes people make and the difficulties they experience, <laughs> which force them to develop in ways they would not otherwise have chosen. And you see, that's a way for the metta to start, um, that, that sense of um, shifting from the, the tuning into the essence and goodness to making space for behavior, our own and others. It's not that we don't hold ourselves accountable or others accountable, which is in the equanimity practice. So it's, it, the, the four Brahma Viharas holds it. Um, but it, this, that is a way of um, accepting our imperfections and making a force. It's only up to us, our own responsibility to um, find the direction to take from learning from the mistake, right? Finding the, the direction to take. So I think that in that, understanding of how to how that happens and how that works that a, it's like a genuine understanding of our own and other natures happens it's a, a genuine understanding not a this isn't about a fake acceptance of joy and sorrow and a fake acceptance of imperfection it's really feeling the pain of it and the harm of it and to intend to do um less harm right it's a, it's like out of that um, genuine ability to accept how things are, which includes imperfection. And it, that's what really makes genuine relationships possible. Otherwise, it's just all projection. It's just all like wishing somebody was like something, relating to them like that, and then getting disappointed <laughs> when it's not like that, or with ourselves like that the disappointment in ourselves or others that it's not holding up to the ideal perfection versus how it is and then how we can relate with loving kindness compassion empathetic joy and equanimity so of course ultimately and you know you'll you hear us saying this over and over again this practice is about looking at our motivation and then seeing if it can shift so that if we're motivated by trying to get something from somebody in a relationship or get rid of something that, um, or with ourselves, that, that we see that and we don't demonize it, we don't reject it, but we see if we can come from a place of genuine love, genuine love for, for ourselves or another versus about something about getting pleasure or power or any of the ways that we, we use people versus can we genuinely connect with ourselves and others just as they are. And I think that, you know, the rest of the talk mostly will be about how to do that, but it, it's kind of like if we're anxious about something uh, and we're anxious about someone else, it's like we're worried about them, and but we're not connecting with them. We're not connecting with the worry, our own worry, our own anxiety. And so by disconnecting from our own anxiety, we really just don't see the other person clearly. We just project it. We're not genuinely connecting. And so this is this, the teaching is around taking responsibility genuinely for our own emotions as a form of love as a form of metta. And, and it's kind of like holding the hand of a little child. It's like holding the hand of our own anxiety or holding the hand of our own loneliness or our own anger, literally like that kind of getting that it's a relationship that we can cultivate the relationship of <laughs> sadness or grief. You're cultivating the, the relationship a genuine care, tenderness, love. And this, this includes everything. It includes the weed, <laughs> the weed halfway up the road. 
that you might not pay attention to. It includes the bird that maybe is very common and we're more interested in something very uncommon, you know, right? Like it includes, this, this is a genuine relationship with boredom or dullness or happiness or compassion. And it's like getting that we're not trying to make everything disappear and destroy it and only have the things we want around <laughs> or that we, we think that's making demands. It's like the making demands on life or letting, getting a genuine relationship with how it is. For me, um, there, there was a teaching of Sri Nisargadatta Maharaj in the book, I Am That, that um, I found um, very useful for this um, bridging love and wisdom. And he, he taught that um, mindfulness is the intention to understand our experience rather than to judge it. And I remember when I first read that, it was like an explosion of my heart, just like because I had practiced enough to see how much, <laughs> how much judgment is in the human mind. It's like the stream of judgment, not just mine and all of ours. It's in some ways it's very generic, um, but to, to know, to realize that we could cultivate an intention to understand rather than to judge that that just went totally against the human conditioning it was so inspiring and heartening. Uh, so I hope you can see that, that in terms of the meta practice, the kindness practice, that this intention to access kindness uh, for ourselves, other beings, how much we need to have the mindfulness, that wisdom practice, where we get that, it, that it's the intention to understand our experience and others. In fact, you could describe metta as love infused with wisdom. It's infused with that understanding. Otherwise, we just use love as a form of control. I love myself if, if this, I love myself, I love you if that, it, it has nothing to do with how things are. And then of course, with the, the Vipassana practice, that understanding of Vedana, of that each moment of consciousness, there's a ple pleasant, unpleasant, neutral feeling tone, not emotional, but mental feeling tone. It, it, that's what really gives us then the, the foundation of being able to go, oh, then what is a person? What is me? What is you? What is, what is this difficulty with love that we have of being with others and ourselves? It's, it's all around that um, we don't like pain. We don't like people when they're unpleasant. We don't like ourselves when we're unpleasant. We don't like the world when it's unpleasant. It's like, that rejecting of half of life, it's just like, wow, that we get these practices to understand that life includes the pleasant, the unpleasant, neutral. If we don't understand that, how can we love? So of course, the great question is, what is love? So what's so I think um, fun about love and wisdom is that just if you took um, our relationship with thought, our relationship with thinking, and we have all that understanding of the Vipassana, of Anicca, Dukkha, Anatta, just, <laughs> just the three characteristics of experience. And we know that every moment is changing. Thoughts are changing moment by moment. Body sensations are changing moment by moment. Sounds changing moment by moment, that the, et cetera. The base of each moment is impermanent. Our bodies are impermanent. Minds are impermanent. Um, the dukkha aspect of that, the, 
unreliability of experience, the stress of that, the anatta, that no matter how hard you look, you can't find a, a solid, permanent self inside or outside, that these, and that this is, um, experience is uncontrollable, that these, these characteristic, characteristics of existence, without a base in that, how can we love? There would be no um, strength. <laughs> there would be no way that we could hold how disappointing people can be or how disappointing life can be, how things die. Like how, how can you hold all that without the wisdom practice? So what I'm trying to point to is that these, these practices just give us more and more strength. They're different ways of looking at life and tools, but they just keep giving us more and more strength and more and more strength to be able to love genuinely. So for example, you know, just with past thought, future thought, repeating thought patterns, or greedy thoughts, right? The fear thoughts. With the Vipassana practice, one way of relating to them is generically. It's just thinking. We all have them. And it, we look closely at them and they, they, they're like, they move so fast. If you look closely at them, they're like a blur. They're, they're so unsolid. They're so ephemeral. They're so ins insubstantial. They literally um, have no weight. They literally have no power except what we give to them. So when we think of loving ourselves or others or a cat, or a dog, right? It's like the mind, the heart, the body. What are we loving? Do we love all of their thoughts? Do we love none of their thoughts? Or ourselves? And emotions, I mean, emotions, often if it's like we look at repeating thought patterns and we take the time, we're not in a hurry, and we find maybe underneath a lot of future thought might be fear. Do we reject a person and not love them because they're afraid or if they're angry, right? Or if they're needy, yeah. Or if we're, we're hiding that we're, we feel shame, right? Or, or all the ways that the unpleasant, painful emotions um, can cause us to reject and not care, not be kind, not love. Um, it's, it's without that Vipassana ability to investigate, to explore, to see clearly that we are not our thoughts. You are not your thoughts. I am not my, I am not my emotions. You are not your emotions. I am not my body. You are not your body. Um, you know, love, again, is not necessarily something based on anything real or true. It would be just an idea of how somebody should be. I have to say, I, I do that. There's a cat, one of the feral cats. I it's just like, so you've heard me talk about it, but she's so good for me with this because it's been almost 11 years and it really has changed. I mean, there has been some change because most of the time I've known her, when I open the door, she looks at my legs like they're weapons of mass destruction you know they re she really is so afraid and she just looks at me like i am bad news and i you know usually back back away and i try to put the food down in a way that she doesn't freak out and any change from my behavior if i i mean the other day i went out and i just tried to get something off the clothesline and she freaks out she runs away so anyway but recently um she's changed a little bit and uh that the kind of evening ritual of sort of standing there and she will dare to come by. And I realize that she talks to me with her tail. And I like it when I have shorts on. It's hard when I have my sweats pants on because I can't hear what she's saying very well. It's like she'll dare to come along and she'll just like come along. And she actually moves her tail in ways that I know she's trying to talk with me. Um, and it's so moving to me. Um, 
but then sometimes it's so hard to um, accept that that's how it is, right? That, that that's as much as she can handle, that that little bit of time, a few minutes at night, is her capacity for connection. And yet, what, what do, who am I? What am I doing? Why, why, why do I think I should know that she should be any different, right? So she's taught me so much about love, you know, that unconditional love, just in that level. Of course, everyone is our teacher. All beings are our teacher for seeing yet again and again how we think it should be <laughs> and we disconnect from what's happening versus how it is. So here again, there's that love and wisdom. It's like, oh, this person isn't doing what I want them to be doing. It's okay. We're, we can say, of course, I wish they weren't doing that. I wish, I wish this cat could have a little bit more, less, less fear, of course. But there, there again, it's not what's happening. So the, the fun part about the practice is to watch our energetics with what's appearing. So if an emotion appears in ourselves or others, do we pounce on it? Do we judge it? Do we bludgeon it? Do we move away from it? Everything how we relate inside is how we relate outside. So that you don't have to worry about how you're going to relate outside, because the more you work well with your own fear, you get a relationship of non-judgment with fear and learn how to work with fear being impermanent and coming and going by itself. Then when a fear appears outside of yourself, you can apply the same wisdom and love. It's not my fear or your fear. It's just the experience of fear coming and going by itself, like the experience of tightness in the neck coming and going by itself, or the appearance of light vibration in the um, shoulder coming and going by itself, or the appearance of compassion coming and going by itself. You start to get a sense of the fluidity and uh, incredible change that we call uh, I or me or you and what we love. I won't uh, go into the cause, but I've had uh, about three weeks of what I would call bone breaking fatigue, very intense, just all per, I would call it an all pervasive fatigue that, um, you know, I, I won't go into all the words I can describe it, but it's so much fun because, in, you know, I can give you 10 million words for meta, but I, I haven't explored fatigue in this way before and it's given me an opportunity to go from like oblivion to to uh, blob to fog to dullness i have all these new descriptions and uh, but after a few weeks of kind of trying to be with it uh sometimes it'll the, the thought will come enough already enough already but of course that doesn't stop it that has nothing to do with anything except it's a version. Uh, so um, I just wanted to share some places because I often we'll often share with other things, but this is uh, really interesting. I notice when I'm sitting that I'll have this slight like holding back from it. Of course, you know because I can't do anything if I don't if I surrender. But I just said I thought what will happen if I just totally accept the fatigue. And I fell asleep. Like it was great. It was like, oh, there's no energy, right? And then I started doing that for a whole sitting. I would just go, oh, I'll just totally accept this. And I'd just go totally out. And then, but when I would come back to it was like this the 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 difference between being totally unconscious to coming to my mind felt so bright, like so it was like so amazing. It was like a miracle. And I just was like, wow. 
I like this, right? And then I was just watching that, not liking the fatigue and the oblivion, and but then the passing out. And then it was just watching that to the point where it's like, wow, I don't have to be identified with any of this. It's great for practice for, you know, getting old, by the way, or dying. You know, it's like, we think we're going to just go out in a big storm of, you know, meteor showers, but it's like, most likely we're going to have some <laughs> tiredness and <laughs> fatigue and that identification with the awakeness versus, or at least dullness to really gonzo. Um, and to know that that teaching that's so important of Vipassana, which is that it's not the experience that matters. It's how we're relating to it. And of course, I prefer not to be this tired. Um, it's getting a little better, but um, it's like having half a spark plug in your car going at this point. It's better, you know. Um, but I think that just that I have such a gratefulness for the practice and that to see this kind of contentment possible for any experience, right? This deep peace, contentment is peace. And uh, the other story I wanted to share, I'm sharing, you know, the ones where I see this shift, you know, this great shift that, um, one of the, the other feral cat, the daughter, um, the, the feral cats are very susceptible to eye infections. They get um, HIV and, um, or herpes. Uh, and um, if I call a vet, they will always say, I can't treat the cat unless you bring it in. And then I'm like, I can't bring it in. <laughs> They've been fixed. That was it. They will not go in a trap. Forget it. You know, and then it's like, I'm like, well, please, please, please. I can give you, I'll send you pictures. I know you can just send some antibiotics. And then I realize, oh, actually the cat won't, this particular cat, there's no way it's going to have it to eat an antibiotic. I tried a couple of times. It eats all around it, no matter what I do. So um, a friend down the street um, who had 30 feral cats when I moved into the neighborhood. Um, she told me about this stuff called colloidal silver where um, you can put it in wet food and it usually helps. Um, and at all these years, over 10 years that the colloidal silver has helped, but this time it didn't. And her eye just kept getting more infected and closed shut and oozing. And for a few weeks, it was just getting so bad. So I called the vet again and, um, The, the, the her eye had turned all white like the all white and the vet said oh she's blind and she's going to stay blind it's permanent and then I was taking that in and she said um, now this is my karmic knot so I'm, I even have to take time to tell you it because so it was so painful she said um, the cat is blind and you didn't try hard enough And I was like, it just triggered me into feeling like, oh, it was all my fault. It's true. I didn't try hard enough. The cat's blind. And I was like, wow. And in the past, I would have really gone down for days. But I just, it's just trying to give you a sense of just like, I was like, wait a minute. And then I got really mad. Of course, I kind of got very like, what? I was like, um, I didn't say it to her. I was appreciating that she called. But I, I just said, well, I guess I have no nothing to do but um, accept it and she said yes that's what you should do you know she, she's blind uh, she'll adjust and I'm like well what do I do if this happens again and she just said well you just have to accept that your cats will go blind and I, so then um, I just decided to really amp up the colloidal silver silver but I read about it some years ago and it actually you can turn blue. You can actually, it's not good if you get too much silver, like you could turn blue. So I kept giving this cat more and more silver thinking, oh no, it's gonna, it's gonna turn blue. But I just was like, well, if, you know, it's worth a try. So I kept giving her more and more. And actually um, the white went away and there was like a, a over the cornea, it was like all um, like scarred and like 
okay, she can follow me with her iris. I could see she's not totally blind, but I kept doing it, kept doing it, and her eye is totally okay. Like it's, she's not blind, it's fine. Um, but I just found it just so interesting to see that place in me where the self-hatred will just lock in and I'll be merciless. And um, I'm not saying I'm totally cured, but it was a really wonderful moment where I, I just paused and I was like, I actually, I, I don't think that's true. I don't think it's all, first of all, I don't think it's all my fault, but I also feel like I have actually have been trying hard enough, but it's like, I actually thought, well, I'll just try harder and it worked. So it was sort of helpful. Again, it's that sense of like, uh, doing it's like when steve talks about the full commitment without attachment to result like doing nothing without attachment to result it's like i had very little idea that her eye would get this good you know that there's nothing on that cornea it's gone it's clear you know but it, and it's maybe some other time it wouldn't work as well but it's just that sense that um being very careful of believing thought right? It's like that sense that thought, we've been trained to think of thought as the god or the goddess and that the body sensations or smells or tastes or sounds aren't as worthy information or our heart, you know, right? And that it's like um, thoughts are meant to be discerned and emotions are meant to be discerned, right? They're not, none of them are perfect. It's like they're information, eyes, sight, smells, taste. We, we're a human beings were this amazing instrument of um, sensitivity and we get information through the six sense stores and we're not meant to take it as all rejection or all indulgence. It's like you discern it with the tools of the Brahma Viharas and the mindfulness. We have to be very careful Apamada, carefulness. Did I forget a page? I think I did. <laughs> Gone. Yeah. So it's it's um before I end, I just think it's just that that encouragement to understand that most of the time when we're suffering, we believe we can control how things are. It's, a, it's like, it's a delusion. It's like, we believe we can. And then it's like taking the time to pause and untangle, untangle that belief system. Well, we find more and more trust because there's less doubt. There's less doubt because we don't feel like, oh, it's all my fault, I failed, or this person failed, or the other failed. It's like, it's much more a sense of um, kindness, care, appreciative joy, equanimity, as we go through these next weeks. Mm. <laughs> There's a, a book called I Am That with Sri Nazargadatta, who's a great teacher from India. And uh, somebody said to him, you make all these extraordinary statements about yourself. What makes you say those things? What do you mean by saying that you are beyond space and time? I love this book because it's so funny. Like most of the time, you know, there was one question where they say that somebody says, do you mean to say that you spend your, all your time repeating this? I am not that I am not. That is one technique in the Mahasi when, when with a thought I am, you know, this is not me. This is not mine. This is not who I am with an emotion. This is not me. This is not, I, this is not who I am. And so this, this person says, uh, do you mean to say that you spend all your time repeating this? I am not 
that I am not. And he said, of course not. I'm merely verbalizing for your sake. <laughs> I realize that I'm neither the object nor the subject, and I don't need to remind myself of that all the time. I just love like how funny he is, you know, of course not. Um, I do not need to remind myself all the time. So then they ask him like, you know, how, how can you say I'm beyond, you're beyond space and time? And he just said that there was a certain point where he just became more realized and he became free of desire and fear. He just kept practicing and then, um, and he said, the main change was in my mind. It became motionless and silent responding quickly, but not perpetuating the response. Spontaneity became a way of life. The real became natural, and the natural became real. And above all, infinite affection, love, dark and quiet, radiating in all directions, embracing all, making all interesting and beautiful, significant and auspicious. May that be so for all of us. Let's sit for a minute. And above all, infinite affection, love, dark and quiet, radiating in all directions, embracing all, making all interesting and beautiful, significant and auspicious. May that be so for all of us. So the Sunday beings, uh, Sunday sit beings will see you next Sunday. The weekend beings will see you in an hour <laughs> for the metta chant sit, final metta chant sit. And uh, the people here for a month or the next week or two, uh, oh boy, we have more time. So <laughs> we'll be sitting in an hour. <laughs> 